Good evening, and welcome to the Mill Valley Historical Society's first Wednesday speaker presentation. My name is Deborah Schwartz, and although my term as a board member for the Mill Valley Historical Society finally expired, I shall maintain my work with our oral history program and first Wednesday speakers for now, at least for now. Uh, tonight's presentation is titled History and Maritime Heritage of Belvedere and Tiburon, and our speaker is historian and archivist David Gotts. As many of you know, this talk was actually scheduled for last month, but just before we were set to begin, the heavens scowled and the huskies howled and the wind began to blow. And then I heard a pop and an explosion and boom, no electricity. But here we are again tonight, cool and calm and ready to give it another go. Also with us tonight is Franklin Walder from the Mill Valley Public Library. You can't see him, but he's in the background making sure everything runs smoothly. Thank you, Franklin. And of course, we want to thank our longtime partner, the Mill Valley Public Library, for allowing us to host our speaker series in this safe and accessible format. Before we begin, I want to say to those of you in the audience who are already members of the Mill Valley Historical Society, thank you for your, for your generosity and interest. Your membership allows us to continue our efforts to infuse history into the present through speaker presentations, oral interviews, history walks, history plaques, and the last and the collaboration to restore and return to Mill Valley engine number nine, the last remaining locomotive from the Mill, the Mount Tamalpais Scenic Railroad. For those of you who are not yet members, please join us. Membership ensures that you will be alerted to future talks such as tonight's and our annual walk into history that takes place on Memorial Day weekend. And we, you will, will receive Chuck Olenberg's charming Mill Valley history vignettes via email, and you will be updated about other historical events in our town and nearby. Membership to our organization is so affordable and just a click away on the Mill Valley Historical Society website. For practical purposes, the audience must be muted for this webinar, but functional tools are located at the bottom of your screen to help us communicate with each other. If you can't see them now, just hover your cursor over the area and they should appear. Now look for the chat icon. The chat tool allows you to post comments, say hello to friends, and we encourage you to add substantive information during this presentation. Look for the Q&A option next. The Q&A option is where you can post questions you may have about tonight's presentations, and I'll address those questions to Dave after his talk. But if you have comments or personal stories to share, the chat room is the best place for that. Tonight's talk will last about an hour, and after we'll take time for questions and comments from the audience. This event is being recorded and will be available on the Mill Valley Historical Society website in about three or four days. Just click events, select First Wednesday Lecture Series, and you'll find tonight's recording as well as many others. Tiburon Peninsula, which includes the town of Tiburon and the city of Belvedere, is the largest part of the Rancho Corte Madera del Presidio granted to John Thomas Reed in 1834 by the Mexican government. Initially, an agrarian society of cattle ranches and dairy farms, with the arrival of the railroad and ferry terminus at Point Tiburon in 1884, the peninsula became an industrial and maritime center, as well as a residential and tourist destination. Tonight, Dave explores the many industries and pastimes that evolved along the shores of this scenic part of the North Bay with rare and historic photos from the Belvedere, Belvedere Tiburon Landmark Society collection. How fortunate we are to have such a highly qualified historian with us tonight. Dave Gotts has been the archivist for the Belvedere Tiburon Landmark Society since 2009. And in 2015, Dave became the official historian for the town of Tiburon. Dave continues to make short films about Tiburon Peninsula history, utilizing the vast collection of photos and historic information contained in the landmarks archives. 
So please, won't you give a warm welcome to Dave Gotts. Hi, Dave. Hi. Thank you, Deborah. So nice to have you with us this evening. Yes. It's good to be here, finally. I'm glad to month, see you. I had a month to rehearse the program, so it should be good. good. Well, I will step away, and you will be front and center, and I'm very much looking forward to your talk. Thank you. We're going to begin with a short video about the history of the railroad coming to Tiburon, which gives a whole history of the Tiburon Peninsula as well. And then we'll go on to uh, the whole PowerPoint. <laughs> Much of the way downtown Tiburon looks today is a direct result of the establishment of a railroad terminus here in the late 1880s. From the Shoreline Park and Main Street to the bike path that leads to town, the footprint of that original industrial enterprise remains. When John Reed was granted the 5,000 acres of the Rancho Corte Madera del Presidio in 1834 by the Mexican government, what is now the town of Tiburon was more water than land. Corinthian Island was indeed an island, and the whole of downtown was awash. Forty years later, the California gold rush had totally transformed the San Francisco Bay Area. Not only had the population exploded, but the silty runoff from the gold mining had begun filling up many of the shallow areas of the bay, including Tiburon. However, the Tiburon Peninsula was only sparsely inhabited. The only activities were the reed and lyford dairies, several brick kilns, a cod fishery, and an explosives factory. Everything changed when the railroad magnate Peter Donahue decided that Point Tiburon would be the perfect place for a ferry terminal to connect to his San Francisco and North Pacific Railroad lines, which ran up through Marin and Sonoma counties. In 1870, he had established a ferry connection to San Francisco for his Sonoma lines at a new town on the Petaluma River, named for himself. Although the town of Donahue grew into a bustling community with machine shops, warehouses, a hotel, and many residences, the long ferry ride was never very popular. When the competing North Pacific Coast Railroad started building a line to Sausalito, it was time for Peter Donahue to make the move south. In 1882, he created the San Francisco and San Rafael Railroad to connect his new terminal in the Marin capital to Point Tiburon. To make way for his new rail yard, Donahue had to turn the Bluff Point and adjacent marshes into a plateau. He did so in record time with a new machine called the Steam Shovel and had crews working around the clock creating the flat land that we now know. This photo from about 1883, a year into the work at Point Tiburon, shows what the Marin Journal reported in November of that year. This point has made a grand advance. The waterfront has a fine ferry slip, long wharf, tracks, a depot, machine shops, a store, boarding houses, etc., part of which have already been built, and all of which will be by spring. To bring a rail line from San Rafael to Tiburon, Donahue would spend nearly $700,000 because the line needed three tunnels, extensive low trestles over marshes, and a dramatic high trestle at Trestle Glen. The railroad first went through the 1,000-foot Cal Park Tunnel, coming out at what is now Larkspur Landing, where it crossed the Corte Madera Creek via a 90-foot drawbridge. The track then crossed over marshland on a low trestle before reaching solid ground near today's village at Corte Madera Shopping Center. A second tunnel of 1,900 feet went through the base of Ring Mountain, parallel to what is now Highway 101. The rails emerged into daylight close to the site of Kol Shafar Synagogue before hooking east past the new Reed Station and along the pastures of the Big Reed Dairy Ranch, which is now where Bel Air School is. A final 600-foot tunnel came out above the site of today's Belveron and launched onto a massive trestle which crossed the marshlands which we now call Blackie's Pasture. The last two and a half miles were an easy run along the picturesque Richardson's Bay, nearly all of which was made into the multi-use path in 1970. The final section was carried on a low trestle over the edge of Tiburon Lagoon. The last vestige of this lagoon is the small marsh and pond behind Town Hall. It didn't take long for Tiburon to prosper and grow. By the early 1890s, as this fine panorama shows, the train yards and Main Street are well established. 
with many of the buildings seen here actually barged down from the abandoned town of Donahue, including the large Sonoma House Hotel on the corner of Main Street and the four matching 12-room boarding houses along the lagoon. For the next 60 years, the railroad defined the character of Tiburon, a bustling, hard-working community built on one of America's greatest industries. All right, we'll start with the, um, of course, the railroad came in Tiburon, and a significant part of that uh, that we're going to address is the ferries that also came. And the ferry... How am I advancing this thing? Oh, there it is. This is Tiburon in about 1883 or four, just after the railroad got there. And with the railroad came ferries, lots of ferries. And the importance of that is it allowed a connection to San Francisco, which allowed the community to grow and made Tiburon what it is today. It was the connection with ferries initially. And uh, it also created what became Belvedere because without ferries, no one could get to Belvedere either. So these ferries ran from the very beginning. The first ferry launched in Tiburon in 1889 was the Ukiah. It was the only ferry built in Tiburon. And uh, it's 291 feet long. And at the time was the second largest ship on the West Coast. Could carry 1,200 passengers and 12 rail cars in the lower deck. And this is uh, Tiburon circa 1892. Here's the Ukiah at its dock where it can load rail cars. This two towers here is called a gallows wheel frame and it had wheels at the top and it could lit, raise and lower the apron so that it would be level with the deck of the ship depending on the tides. And this is downtown Tiburon over here. Okay, next we've got and this is unloading passengers at the passenger shed, um, at the passenger end of the Tiburon yard, which is at the opposite end from where you just saw the Ukiah docked, and we'll see more pictures of that. This is the railroad depot and ferry depot. This is still there. The building is still there. And these uh, gentlemen, large crowd actually for going to Tiburon, people say, why are there so many people going to Tiburon? Well, I suspect that this is a crowd of men, mostly, going to the Corinthian Yacht Club and onto the drawbridge, which connected Tiburon to Belvedere for the opening day on the Bay Celebration. Here's the railroad depot. There's a ferry at the dock. They just came off here. This train's waiting to go to uh, San Rafael, the number three train, and there's some carriages waiting to take people over to Belvedere. And so... And that's what we got here. Next. Okay. I wish I could zoom in on this, but apparently I can't. Zoom option isn't working for me. Anyway, this is about this is from Corinthian Yacht Club at the tip of Corinthian. Looking back, you got old St. Hillary's up on the hill here. This is Main Street. There's the Ukiah. The rail yard is in between, and way at the far end is where the railroad depot is at this building here. Angel Island, of course, in the background. This is a better view. This was in the film we just saw. Um, again, this is the Tiburon, which is another ferry. We'll talk about that. This is the James M. Donahue, a side wheel ferry, as opposed to the double enders. This is wood piled up on the long dock for the railroad engines to use. They use wood and the ferries used coal. This is the Corinthian Yacht Club, which we'll get to later. This island at this time was called Valentine's Island because a man named Thomas Valentine owned it. And when the island was sold to the Corinthian Island Company, they named the island for the Yacht Club. So it's not the other way around. This is Main Street. These are the buildings that were barged down from Donahue's Landing up on the Petaluma River. This would be West, uh, Mar West right below here. These houses are still there and we'll see them a few more times. This is looking from the other direction. This is the Ukiah sitting here. This is the depot building at the very back. These are passenger cars and the passenger shed. This is Mar West in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. These houses in 1908, they're still there as today. A couple have been slightly remodeled, but most of them are exactly as you see them here. This is Main Street 
the previous view you saw these lovely buildings on Main Street, which you can't see very clearly, but there was a wind-driven fire in 1906 that burned down all of downtown Tiburon. So the subsequent, these buildings were built quickly in about 1907. And this building here, which was destroyed in the 06 fire, is the oldest building in Tiburon. It's still there. That's where you can go get a pizza at Waypoint Pizza. That was built in 1907. And again, the Ukiah here, the Donahue in the center, and the railroad depot at the back. This is the James M. Donahue, which is a side wheeler. And it was really a beautiful ship, as you can see. And it was the main ship that went between the Lakeville station of Donahue down to San Francisco. It was built in 1875. So it's a very old ship. And uh, it was uh, parked here a long time. It didn't really operate that much once the double enders came into use because it couldn't carry freight. It had to be hand loaded, but it was a beautiful ship. And it was uh, there until um, the 1920s. Uh, and uh, Peter Donahue himself used this ferry to bring dignitaries over to Tiburon on May the 1st, 1884, when he opened the railroad yard in Tiburon. From the establishment of the ferry terminal in Tiburon until the arrival of the Akaya in 1890, the ferry Tiburon, built in 1884, was the queen of the San Francisco North Pacific ferries and remained in service until 1925. The Tiburon was the first one of the first to carry horseless carriages on board. And it looks like a group of folks come back from wine country on their horseless carriage, ready to go back to San Francisco. Um, this, is, this deserves magnification, okay? You can see that? Magnification? Yay, okay. Yay. So there's the ferry depot. This building is the only part left, which we'll see later. Mostly freight at this point, not any, many passengers. Here's the James M. Donahue's. It's lost its stack. It's ready to be scrapped in about 1924. There's the Corinthian Yacht Club. This is more or less Paradise Drive. This is Main Street. In here, there's a little palm tree, and that palm tree is still there. But then you can see this gigantic lagoon back here, which is goes all the way from, as I said, from the back of Main Street to San Rafael F. So we'll escape from that, and we'll move to the next one. Okay, so this aerial is pretty neat. This shows, and I said at the beginning, in that film said that this was scraped down and created this flat land. And this escarpment on the side of, uh, this, is, this would be Mar West, you can see it today, it's still there. It's still a raw scraped side. And that goes to 1884 when they scraped the land down to create this flat surface here for the rail yard. And I was explaining again how the, so no, we'll not go to that, go back. How, uh, Tiburon Boulevard was brought across here like that. I have to get back to that. And this is Beach Road. We'll move on to the next one. Okay, this is the Ukiah, and it ran for 30 years, including heavy work it did for the military during World War I and was pretty tired. So by 1922, it was uh, rebuilt as the Eureka. The, the, the uh, hull is the same and also is the engine. And the Eureka could carry up to 3,500 people, pretty tight quarters. Um, it could also carry 120 automobiles now on the lower deck, not rail cars. And it, and, uh, it could carry, carry 1,500 passengers at the same time as it was carrying that many autos. The power, this is interesting, the power for the Eureka was the, uh, the same engine as it was on the Ukiah, three-story tall walking beam engine and it's the kind that powered all the ships, the side wheelers and uh, all the side wheel ships. And the piston, a single piston, 65 inches wide with a 12 foot stroke, 1,700 horsepower. And it, the up and down motion would go up and down here, was changed to rotary motion and power 27 foot wide paddle wheels at 24 revolutions per minute. And I happened to find a very interesting little video. 
He's just talking about that mainly you're seeing the uh, walking beam engine in operation, and that is the Eureka. So here's a, quite a few years later. This is um, probably about 1927. Um, this is downtown Tiburon. This is the back of Main Street. Here's the building I was telling you about, the Waypoint Pizza Inn. That's still there. Here's the palm tree. If you've been to Tiburon, you know that there's a big palm tree right at the end of Main Street. That's it. It was planted probably in about 1920. And at this point, they're actually operating car ferries, new diesel-powered car ferries. And you can see the cars on the on the new dock they just built for that. And that was, it, they ran them from about 1927 to 1929. It wasn't a successful operation. These ferries, there's another one behind that I can't see because Deborah's there. Um, it, there's, there are two ferries there, and those ferries, there were four of them, or three of them, and they were all sold to uh, Washington. And they operated until the 1980s as car ferries in Puget Sound. Um, in the foreground, this ferry right here is called the Marin. And the ferry Marin was a small ferry built for the run from Tiburon to Belvedere to Sausalito to meet the passenger ferries that were now exclusively going back and forth from Sausalito. So we'll get more about that later. Here again are those houses up on Mar West, all still there, this one, all those new ones there. This is an interesting object. This is called a viaduct. And this goes way back probably to about the 1910s. And it allowed the people who lived on this side of the rail yard to cross this rail yard safely without having to walk across and dodge rail cars. Some people ask about this interesting thing here. It's a little boat and uh, the owners of the boat shop here would take people out in their boat and then launch them into these smaller rowboats once they'd gotten through Raccoon Straits and around the backside of Tiburon where the water was calm. David, we can, uh, Franklin will assist you to load the the um, videos if you like when it's time, just. That's it, there aren't any more. Anyway, so this is the dock, um, this is a, 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 the dock in Belvedere. It, it only appears in a handful of photos because it was only there from about 1911 or 12 until 1930 and then they tore it down because it wasn't used anymore. So this is Beach Road back here. Um, we'll be talking more about that. There's the Hillarita Dairy, which is where Reed School is now. The drawbridge is right around this corner here behind Corinthian Island. We'll, we'll go over some of this other again later. And then uh, February 1st, 1941, the ferry service ended. Obviously the Golden Gate Bridge opening in 1937, it, kind of killed the ferry traffic. So it completely stopped. And the Eureka was the last ferry to run between Marin and San Francisco. The Eureka was later donated to the state of California in 1958 and has been on display at the San Francisco Maritime Museum ever since. And with a major restoration in 1994, it is the only walking beam engine preserved in its original form on a ship in the United States. So after the ferry stopped, all the, uh, main, all the freight uh, traffic went via barge. And here you can see the gallows wheels I was talking about, they were enclosed in those towers before, but now that you can see them and they raise and lower this little apron to make sure that the rail cars can go on flat onto the barge or before onto the ferries. Here they are loading uh, some redwood and basically things were just winding down in Tiburon in the 50s and 60s and that's the way it was. And these wheels that you see here are now, some of them are on display in front of the railroad museum in Tiburon. It's a nice colored photo. This is an interesting shot because these three flat cars separate the engine from the cars he's loading onto the barge. And the reason is they didn't want the weight of the engine to go on the flat piece, the uh, go on to the um, apron because of the weight of the engine would 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 be too strong for the apron. But you can see here the apron is lower than the side, and that's how they got this stuff on level. This is what the yard looks like. Maybe there are a few people out there who still remember it when it looked like this, just kind of a muddy mess. This is the 1960s. Here's some sections of that viaduct that used to go across here. Everything's pretty much winding down. And uh, the railroad, all the shops were closed in 1963. And the last train ran out of Tiburon 
September 25th, 1967. And ferry service was restored in 1962, and the ferry service looks like this today. And here is a then and now, here's the photo we saw earlier from about 1908, and here's 110 years later. Main Street's the same. Depot building is still there. These houses over here, still there. So it hasn't changed a lot. Here's the depot 1903, and here's what it looks like today. And you can visit the Railroad and Ferry Depot Museum on weekends and Wednesdays during April to October and during the winter time. If it's a sunny day, there'll be somebody there opening it from one to four, and you can see a lot more about the railroad history. So the second industry we're gonna follow is the cod fisheries, which I mentioned in the movie at the beginning, but you didn't hear it. Anyway, um, so schooners would go up to Alaska and off the coast, coast of Siberia, and they'd fish and get codfish, which was salted on board the ship, brought back to San Francisco for cleaning and drying and flaking and taken to market. The very earliest uh, codfish was on Beach Road. Codfish processing plant was on Beach Road. And this is 1864. This little drawing by Captain Edwin Moody, who, by the way, was one of the founders of the San Francisco Yacht Club. And he described that these two boats here, this is Corinthian Island. You can see this is where the drawbridge is eventually. And it really is an island at this point in 1864. And this is Beach Road, but at the time it was called Stillwater Beach because this was called Stillwater Bay, calm water. And this ship was, uh, was owned by Matthew Turner, who later was a famous shipbuilder in Sausalito. And he's, he's the one discovered um, that there was codfish aplenty in the North Pacific. And this was supposedly, well, this drawing is supposedly the very first codfish brought back to be dried on, in San Francisco. This is an early view of Beach Road showing a large codfish plant that was eventually built there in the early, in the 1880s. This is the China Cabin, which was a, a Victorian, on a, a Victorian salon that was on the Trans-Pacific ship, the P.S. China, which went between San Francisco and the Orient. When it was brought in to be scrapped in the Tiburon Harbor in 1886, the cabin was taken off, put on, and barged over to Beach Road and put on pilings. And it's still there today. The Landmark Society restored it in the 1980s. And it's a beautiful little building. Okay, here we are looking down from Corinthian Island. This is the uh, William F. Stone, who was a well-known boat builder, was here. Here's the cod fishery uh, and the bunkhouses. This is a very odd ship turned into a rent a, a residence. The, a lot of uh, shipwrecking that went on because wooden ships didn't last very long. And a man named Nicholas Bichard, who also was a partner in this cod fishery, he took an old cod fishing ship called the Tropic Bird, and he put a two-story apartment building on the back and backed it into Beach Road, and then you had a residence. China Cabin is in here. This is Belvedere over here. This is a really great picture looking down uh, Beach Road from Belvedere. This is the Belvedere Hotel. We'll get to that a little later. These are the far cottages right here. They're still there. This is the China Cabin. It actually had a roof put on it one time. Here's a good view of the Tropic bird, the cod fishery is still here, but boat shop. Here's the drawbridge that we'll be talking about a little later. So this is the Tiburon Lagoon, and this is the Belvedere Cove, and this all that water goes in and out through this little opening here that eventually was closed off. This is the first Tiburon school, and this is old St. Hilary's, of course, or St. Hilary's Missing Church at the time. Beach Road had quite a bit of business on it back then. Today, there is no business. There are no businesses pretty much on Beach Road. This is a barn that was owned by the Belvedere Land Company to keep carriages to pick people up from the railroad. I mean, the ferries when they came in. Had to have a walkway over here because this is marsh and probably tidal came right up here. Walkway over to the land company building, which is right here. The land company, the Belvedere Land Company was created in 1890 to sell lots on the island of Belvedere, which the land company owned.
another view of Beach Road. The cod fishery is still here, more or less all the same things. It's interesting, here are some arcs, both floating in the Belvedere Cove and also on pilings over here along the railroad tracks. And again, the Hillarita Dairy, which is where Reed School is. So you get a little bit of an orientation. One last look at Beach Road. The cod fishery has been replaced by the Pacific Motor Boat Clubhouse built in 1912. Bridge has been, the drawbridge has been enlarged, let more water flow through. China Cabin once again, the rail yard, Mar West. Now we'll go to Belvedere's West Shore. It's probably the best known of the cod fisheries. And here we have in 1867, Thomas McCollum financed and outfitted schooners to go to uh, the North Pacific and considered, he was considered the first to permanently engage in codfish business on the West Coast. And he had quite a number of ships. In 1876, he set up a curing station to salt and dry the fish on the west shore of Belvedere, which had not been named Belvedere yet because it hadn't been, it wasn't until 1890 it was named Belvedere. Um, he paid, uh, he bought tide lots, which I won't get into today. It's a complicated story, but these are out over the water, not actually on the land. They're attached to the land just by uh, rough piers. So this is, a, this is 1880, and what's interesting, most interesting about this build, this picture, not only these, the, the great big cod fishery here, but the fact that there are no trees on Belvedere. And that's because there were no trees on Belvedere until the land company planted about 15,000 trees in the 1890s. And there you have 1905 covered with trees. Now we have new bunkhouses here and in large area over here for codfish drying. The uh, McCollum, uh, along with Lyndon Ho, which is we'll get to, is on the east side of Tiburon. They joined together to become the Union Fish Company in 1904, and all the operation moved to this place. And the Union Fish Company is uh, still in operation um, and, and based in Marin County. The This is how they dried the fish, and uh, obviously they wanted to have lots of sunshine, so the west shore of Belvedere was perfect for that. And these, these are called uh, flake, these boards, and they laid them out and dried them in the sun, packed them up and took them off to San Francisco to sell. Fire destroyed a large portion of the plant in 1937, and all that was remaining was the, uh, a warehouse at the end and these, uh, these bunkhouses, residences for the workers. Um, the uh, Union Fish Company sold the property to the land company and they rented this out as housing. And the first residents of the housing there was the artist, sculptor David Lemon and his uh, wife, painter Jerry O'Day. And they were soon joined by other artists and it became sort of a bohemian enclave of artists along the Belvedere's West Shore. Here's David uh, Lemon leaving his place and he named his gallery Pescata Gallery after the original Pescata Landing, which was the cod fishery. The buildings were torn down in the 60s and the shore was filled in and it became West Shore Road and now it's an enclave for beautiful houses. And this is more or less the, the end of the West Shore Road is where the cod fishery was extended just about this whole length here. Now we're to Tiburon's East Shore, which is a, a long story. So originally Lind and Ho, which is the other cod fishery company, bought 12 acres of tide lands because of the deep water. There's a really important thing, both in the West Shore and here, the deep water so ships could come right along shore and unload their cargo. So they set up a cod fishery here and it had 50 acres of land going up on, on the land side plus 12 uh, acres of tide lands. And the McCollum plant operated um, independently and then joined uh, I mean, McCollum, Lyndon Ho joined McCollum and became the Union Fish Company. And at that point, they sold this property to the U.S. government for $80,000 in 1904. And that became the Navy coaling station. And it's seen here in 1907, they're tearing down the original cod fishery buildings and they're going to build a place for uh, coaling the Pacific fleet of the U.S. Navy. 
And here it is in 1908, where the Secretary of Navy reported that it was nearly finished. The storage capacity was going to be 20,000 tons of coal, because that's what all those big ships ran on. And there were other coaling stations in Mexico, in the Puget Sound, in Alaska, and Hawaii. At noon on May 6, 1908, the Great Parade of U.S. Navy ships steamed through the Golden Gate Bridge into San Francisco. There were 42 vessels, including the six white-hulled battleships of Teddy Roosevelt's Great White Fleet. San Francisco was the halfway point of the fleet's historic goodwill cruise around the world. It was estimated that one million people watched from the hills, wharves, and boats at San Francisco as the ships came in. The coaling station on the east side of Tiburon had just been completed, arriving just in time for the ships to arrive to be coaled at the coaling station. And this is the coaling station on Tiburon's east shore. And there are several of the ships of the Great White Fleet waiting to come in and coal at the Tiburon station. This shows you a little bit of how it operated. Here's the coal actually in the middle here. There's a ship probably coming. The, the coal was not produced in California in the West Coast because there wasn't decent coal for ships. It had to be shipped all the way from the East Coast, all the way around the Horn to be unloaded here. And then these big cranes would dump it into these little tiny rail cars that would run around this track and dump it into the ships or barges if a ship had to moor off uh, shore to get the coal. This is Red Rock. So you know kind of where this place is. And the people who lived on the coaling station, there were several residences, one here, one here, one here, this for families who lived there. They had to commute two and a half miles on Paradise Drive or what was then Tiburon Boulevard over to Tiburon to get their mail and their groceries. The coaling station lasted until 1930 when oil took over from coal. Fifteen young men stepped ashore at the former coaling station in March 1931. They were the first cadets at the California Nautical School, created by the state legislator two years, legislature two years earlier to train officers for the Merchant Marine. The coaling site was loaned to the state and had existing facilities for the new school, docks, shops, buildings, classrooms, and barracks. Most of the coal was sold or shipped away, but some remaining cadets, cadets found themselves shoveling it for infractions of the rules, as well as sweeping away coal dust from the parade ground. In 1938, the school became the California Marine Academy. 1940, with war clouds on the horizon, the Navy requested the Academy vacate the premises the Academy eventually found a permanent home in Vallejo. In 1933, John Roebling and Sons Company bought six acres of land on three Thailand acres north of the coaling station at Point Chauncey. Roebling Bridge Division had contract to furnish and erect suspender cables for the Golden Gate Bridge. The wire was shipped from the East Coast and wound and then barged to the bridge for installation. In 1942, the property was purchased by the Navy. Now, the, probably the most famous uh, occupant of this particular site, we're still talking about the same site that was the cod fishery in 1877. It was the Naval Net Depot. And from 1940 to 1945, 10,000 tons of anti-submarine netting was design, designed in, to defend the West Coast harbors was produced at this location. The base employed both enlisted men and civilians to assemble, rig, handle, and maintain the nets, booms, and buoys. The net depot was commissioned in August 1940 with just two officers and a handful of riggers. Some of the equipment left over from the coaling station was used in the net operation. You can see the boom here. The gantry at the back was, was from the coaling station. These buildings were from the coaling station. Some of the houses that you saw on the other were all from the coaling station. Hundreds of men trained in the first six months of operation, 85% of the net was in place by December 7th, 1941. And there it is, it stretched across from Sausalito to San Francisco. And there were several little gates which the ships had to navigate to get in and out. And they, could, they were opened and closed. We'll just see a picture of the net in a moment. This aerial view gives a great uh, look at the uh, Net Depot. Here's this crane still from the age at the time of the coaling stations. 
Um, this is a specifically designed boat to uh, drag the uh, nets out into the sea and put them in place. This is the, the uh, Roebling operation was up here. They eventually used that too. Here's the water tank that goes way back all the way to the coaling station, some of these other buildings as well. This is Paradise Drive going around here. Another good view, this is looking down from Paradise Drive. Here again, you see the railing rail for the gantry. The other one on this side is gone. Here's a lot of the giant uh, floating balls which held the net suspended in the water. And one of the ships for taking the net tenders for taking it out. Same buildings. A lot of these buildings are still there. We'll see going forward. This is what one of the anti submarine nets look like. And they use that big flat concrete pad that they filled in where the coal used to be and have these large balls that suspend on the that float on the surface with the net suspended down below, anchored at the bottom by 100 ton coal. Uh, concrete blocks, and here's the net tender taking out. This is a this is actually anti torpedo netting, smaller holes, and they would drag the whole thing out and put it in place. And the anti submarine netting they use the former Roebling site to put that together. And there's that in place. And during this time, the whole Bay Area basically was a, a giant naval yard, the naval base. And so here you see off Tiburon Coast, numerous ships from the Navy. Um, here's the uh, Roebling site down below. Blimp going overhead. This is where the San Rafael Richmond Bridge is now. This is, of course, Red Rock. So it started to wind down, of course, after the war. And uh, the eventually from 1961 um, to 1978, the property uh, supported a number of marine-oriented federal research facilities. And they also continued to build, to build uh, netting, but here's the research facilities. You can see the gantry support is still there. And the uh, NOAA had one of its facilities here. They use these buildings to do experimentation, fisheries, and test in working in the ocean in the, in the bay. And then in 1978, the federal government gave San Francisco State University the majority of the property, 35 acres, to be used to study natural forces of work in the San Francisco Bay and the surrounding wetland environment. The property was named the Romberg Tiburon Center for Environmental Studies in honor of the president of the university, Paul F. Romberg. Students and visiting scientists have been studying the Bay and facility ever since. The facility has given a new name in 2018. It's the Estuary and Ocean Science Center. And going down to take these pictures a few months ago, it's just amazing how historic this property is. Uh, just to have a quick look, uh, here's, here's this half of the gantry is still there. That's all the way back to the coaling station in 1904. Um, over here, this is actually was a movie theater built for the Net Depot. And behind here is the blacksmith shop from the coaling station era. And it's all still here, which is just absolutely fantastic. And looking from the other side, you see it again. Um, this is looking uh, south towards toward uh, Oakland. And it's, it's just an amazing property. And as a historian, it's incredible that all that is still there. So our final maritime heritage uh, story about Chiburon is the yacht clubs. And we start with the San Francisco Yacht Club. San Francisco Yacht Club was created in 1869 by a group of gentlemen over cigars and brandy in San Francisco. And their original anchorage and clubhouse was located in Mission Bay. Uh, but the in inadequate depth of the water and increasing industrial uh, growth of the area, they moved to Sausalito. In 1877, they built a new clubhouse. In 1897, the clubhouse, along with a lot of their collection, was destroyed by fire. But they immediately built another clubhouse on the same site. And this clubhouse is still there, and it's the Trident Restaurant. 
By the mid-1920s, large ferries running between Sausalito and San Francisco, and this is the clubhouse right here, was creating a great deal of wake and it made it difficult for the mooring of their small boats here. And, uh, and also in the background of this picture, which I just found recently, here's the cod fishery on Belvedere. And way over here is one of the dairies on the Tiburon Peninsula. Here you can see the Tiburon Peninsula in about 1920 or so, nothing on it yet, just a few things. This uh, dairy eventually became Del Mar School. And if we zoom in here, you'll see the Little Marin, the ferry boat that went between Tiburon and Belvedere and Sausalito, docked in Tib Bel uh, Sausalito just as it looked when it was docking in Tiburon. And this is the San Francisco Yacht Club building right there. Also, this is quite possibly a codfish ship that's unloaded its cod at the cod fishery plant here. So because of all the ships coming in and out the ferries, they had to move again, uh, the San Francisco Yacht Club. So they decided that Belvedere Cove, which would be a perfect place for Yacht Club. And they found that this property, which was a beautiful hotel in 1916, but by 1924, it was falling apart and going into disuse. So it was torn down and that's where they were gonna build their new yacht club. In the meantime, they rented the Pacific Motorboat Club on further down on Beach Road. And this would be the Pacific Motorboat Club. Here's the hotel when it was still there. Next to it is a small cove house, which is a private residence. Here's the China cabin again. Here are the far cottages, which are of course still there. And here's a few years later, the, co the hotel has been torn down and the cove house is still here. And then they built their yacht club in about 1934. A nice view of their yacht club, the uh, Belvedere Land Company Cross in this little plaza is still there. Far cottages, the barn is still here. This would be Tiburon Boulevard over here. This is Red Hill. This is where they cut Red Hill away to put Tiburon Boulevard in here. And this is the beginnings of the Belvedere Lagoon. This would be Peninsula Road today. Lagoon Road over on this side. So in, in uh, 1956, uh, they dredged the cove and made a nice uh, yacht harbor. And by 1960, they had 700 members and they increased the size of the clubhouse. And today it looks more or less like that. And then in 2019, the old cove house was torn down and they built the brand new events building um, in a parking lot next to the original clubhouse. The Corinthian Yacht Club, the oldest yacht club on Tiburon in, in Tiburon or Belvedere, actually in Corinthian, right in between. In March 16th, 1886, a group of members of the San Francisco Yacht Club who were small boat sailors felt that their interest in sailing small boats was being ignored. So they met to form a new club and they rented uh, the tip of, of Valentine's Island as it was, was called then for $12 a year. And they built this small yacht club. Almost immediately, the clubhouse proved to be too small. And in 1889, they built the deck and a veranda and still at the end of Valentine's Island. And then by 18, let's see, this is about 1895 or so. Um, no, this is after that, sorry. There's houses. This became Corinthian Island in 1907. So this is probably about 1915 or 19, 1910, I would guess. So they built this uh, lower deck, which was called, uh, now called Pneumonia Alley, which had sleeping rooms and storage for boats. And then, uh, then we have a group of guys gathered on the steps of the original yacht club and their mascot, Dickie the Raccoon. And here is that group of men who are men and women who are coming off the ferry at the very beginning of the Ukiah. They're walking down Main Street, Tiburon. Uh, this is Corinthian Island and the path out to the Corinthian Yacht Club. This uh, photo is taken from standing on the deck of the Sonoma House Hotel, which was destroyed in that big fire in 1906. 
So they're headed over around down Main Street and around what we now call Art Grove over to the drawbridge. And the drawbridge allowed boats to be to go from the Belvedere Cove into the Tiburon Lagoon behind Corinthian in the winter when the weather was worse. And then in the spring, they would come back out and they opened this gate up, I mean, the drawbridge up, and that is called opening day on the bay. That's the original opening day on the bay, right there in Tiburon. Night, the, uh, night, in 1908, they purchased the, the, land, the Corinthian Yacht Club would purchase the property at the end of the island. And a few years later, in 1912, they built what you know now as the Corinthian Yacht Club building, a beautiful Edwardian building but they built it on top of the old pneumonia alley, which is still there. And it was opened on July 4th, 1912. Unfortunately, this photo, we believe is a celebration opening the Yacht Club, but you don't see it. Um, nice shot of back on Main Street of Tiburon though, and a very interesting moment they took this picture. The ladies halfway in the water, or maybe it's a gentleman, we don't know. So by the ninth, in 1950s, the yacht, I mean, the uh, waterfront around Tiburon was getting a little crowded with boats, both from the Corinthian Yacht Club and the San Francisco Yacht Club around the corner. And so they felt that it was time to build a, uh, their own harbor. So in the early 50s, they did a swap of tide line, tidelands. This part here for Sam Vela's over here. This is Sam's and Sam Vela owned uh, Sam Vela owned this house and he owned this tide lot. And so he swapped it for the one that the Yacht Club owned, this one. And so therefore he could extend his deck out and they could build their parking lot and their marina. And this house got moved right back there behind this bank building, which is at the end of Main Street. So it looks like that. So there's a yacht harbor and there's that house and it's still there. And for those of you who like nostalgia, this is Tiburon Tommy's and Sam's of course, and probably Mr. Q's at this time. Possibly the dock, if you go back that far. And then the, uh, starting in the 1970s, uh, the began the annual blessing of the ships. And it's at one point there were up to 4,000 boats out celebrating the opening day on the bay. And today, the Yacht Club is celebrating its 125th anniversary in 2011. And the building is celebrated its 100th anniversary in 2012. Or no, yes, 2012. And old singularities are coming in. Finally, the last Yacht Club that maybe some people don't know about, and we'll go to a picture that's a little bit advanced in date, but this is Paradise K on the backside of Tiburon on off of Paradise Drive, which is up here. And there's a little yacht club over in this corner and it's called the Tiburon Yacht Club. And it was uh, first called, uh, it was called the Paradise Yacht Club and then the Paradise Harbor Yacht Club. And then it was named the Tiburon Yacht Club later on in 1980 but they first had a small building over here in the corner. It was a barge that was left behind by the developers of the Paradise K development. And that was their harbor, that was their yacht club clubhouse for, for a very long time. And this is what it looked like in about 1966. And their yacht clubhouse is back here in the corner, back behind me. And then in 1999, the spit got developed much more and, in, and they built a new bigger breakwater out here and they built a new clubhouse out at the end. And this is what it looks like today. So just wrapping up, I'll go over where we've been. We started out here, downtown Tiburon rail yard still going. Then we went over around Beach Road and we came over to uh, the cod fishery here, and then the cod fishery over here. This is where it was on Belvedere. Then we went all the way over to the other side to where the 
cod fishery, coaling station, net depot, other things. And now the Romberg Center of the uh, Oceanic Research Center. And then we finally ended up the Tiburon Yacht Club, which is right on this corner over here. And now it's out here. And that's just the very early stage of Paradise K being built. And that's what you've got. So, Amazing uh, photographs. Tell us more about your work as an archivist, would you? Well, it, 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 actually, I have one foot out the door. Um, I've been there 13 years, and I'm and I'm retiring as archivist. I'm still going to be the town historian, and I'll probably still spend many hours in the uh, archive. You don't see me, do you? No, come back. Yeah, you know, start my video. There we go. Hi, hey. come back. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> We're juggling lots of balls here. Anyway, yeah, I, I'm I'm only uh, I'm only gonna uh, stay on for a while, but as a as, as an everyday thing. Um, and uh, Jennifer Hartong is going to be our new archivist. And so I I have uh, you know it, I can't stay away from the place. I mean, I because I'm going to continue to make films and do presentations and stuff, and and it's it's the source. It is really the source. Uh, it, it is an amazing archive, and the nice thing about it uh, is that it's small. It's only just like Mill Valley. It's only just Belvedere and Tiburon, maybe a little strawberry, but nothing else. So we can really f drill down and focus. And we're lucky that I think since it was an affluent community from very early on with Belvedere, people had cameras, um, and it's something you forget about it a long time ago. You don't if there aren't cameras, you don't have pictures, and and there were a lot of people who had cameras going back to glass plates and all that, you know, uh, who lived in Belvedere and took pictures of the area in Tiburon. So. Sensational. We've got some questions for you, all right? Sure. Okay. Let's begin with the first. Did the San Rafael Railway join the railway from San Anselmo to Mill Valley? That, the San Anselmo to Mill Valley would have been the, uh, originally the North Pacific Coast. That was the one that ran to Sausalito. So it stayed on that side of the hills, basically. And that also is where the electric train ran to like Manor and out to Fairfax and all that. That was the different, a different line altogether. The Donahue line was, it also went to San Anselmo and into San Rafael. They both were in San Rafael because it was the city, it was the uh, capital of, the, I mean, the county seat. So the, the one that came to Tiburon came from, and it went all the way north to uh, Arcata eventually, or to, uh, yeah, it was Arcata, all the way past U um, Eureka. That was the whole line, the Northwest Pacific. And the section that, that con you know, came to Tiburon came from San Rafael to Tiburon through those tunnels, that even the tunnel that's still now open, that that line that the smart train runs on from Larkspur to San Rafael is the line that came to Tiburon, same line. They mm. just rebuilt it. Um, uh, so that's where it that's where it came through there, and it can then it came on down. You can find remnants of a lot of the old railroads all around Marin County. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that's wonderful about Tiburon and Belvedere is you have a lot of historical signage. And yeah. uh, my husband and I were exploring along the walking path, and you can go up to what was a trellis, I believe. Trestle. 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 Talk about that a little bit, would you? So that's the trestle at Blackie's Pasture, which was in the in the film you saw the old picture of it with the guy standing in front of it. Mm -hmm. um, to get across the marsh there, they had to build two large berms out of rock to launch a trestle over basically a, a low spot in the land, which is what Tiburon Boulevard runs on now. Mm -hmm. So there was a about a I think it's seven hundred foot long trestle went, and they had those two berms, one on each side. And the one that remains is the one on the on the shore side. So that's, so that's that, a wonderful thing to visit for all the audience. Yeah, and it's the original burn that was built in 1883. Same mm -hmm. one, same thing. And Here's the, another question. Was Belvedere treeless because its trees had been cut, cut for down. San Francisco and Marin buildings? No, no. The, all the hills, Tiburon, Belvedere, even Angel Island were barren. Um, the, they're hard, rocky places, and they don't naturally grow trees. Belvedere, with that photo you saw, that's the way it looked. The only trees that would grow would be the native oaks in the in the valleys where the water would collect in the winter. Same in Tiburon, always bare. Everybody always asked what happened to all the trees. 
they weren't there because also the Tipron Hills were grazed from the 1870s by cows and cattle and, and no sheep, just cows and cattle. And so anytime a little possible little tree would grow up, the cow would eat it. So again, in Tiburon, same thing, just scrub oaks down the, down the uh, canyons where every water would collect hmm. until they're all planted. Everything you see now is all planted. Yes. Uh, uh, here's another question. Uh, who built the large house above the Corinthian Yacht Club? Originally, that one in the picture you saw, that was a, a man named Plant. And he was um, one of the partners in the Corinthian Island Company. There were four partners who bought the island from Thomas Valentine's widow. He owned the island originally. It's a long story how he got it. But they bought it. They created the island, Corinthian Island Company, named for the Yacht Club. And that he built, he must have been the major owner because he <laughs> built right on the point. That house has since been rebuilt. There's still a house there now, but it's a new house. It's, I mean, not new, but it's not the original house. It stands out, though. Yes, just yes. Yeah. And it's, yeah. And that's where a little, there's a little turnaround there right above the Yacht Club. Right. Uh, this is not a question, but it's a comment, but I'm going to read it anyway. Absolutely fascinating. And that is true. Uh, here's another question. Here's from Wendy. What are the tide lot, lots that you mentioned? Yeah, and how I, can yeah, we access it, it, that's, a, that's an, a, a pretty good question because it, it, I didn't have room to talk about it, but it has a lot to do with all these different properties. Um, in 1871, the state of California auctioned off all the water up to nine feet at low tide, which is quite a bit out because overall the San Francisco Bay is pretty shallow. And like if you go by um, Blackie's Pasture at low tide, it's mud all the way over to Strawberry. All that was actually sold as land in big squares. And there's a map that was created and there was an auction in 1871. It was to finance the new state government to build buildings in Sacramento and stuff. So all those became land. And very often um, they were bought just themselves and then they put things on it, like the cod fisheries they built on them. And then even downtown Tiburon was all tie lot. Um, and that was the thing with the Yacht Club and Sam Vela, they traded their, their little tie lots. And that the, the um, San Francisco Yacht Club, where they are, where the Belvedere Hotel was on Beach Road, that was a tide lot. They had to buy a tide lot to build their pier out over the water. By by the 1960s, people were getting a little crazy filling in tide lots and such. And uh, and so that's when BCDC started, the Bay Area Conservation District. And they said, hey, no more building on these things. So they basically became just water in front of your house, but you couldn't put anything on it. And mm -hmm. some people have docks and things on their tide lot that they own but they can't do anything. They can't take them out and build new ones or anything like that. It's all frozen now. Mm. Uh, the same Wendy also asks, how can we access your photos? How can you access my photos? Well, um, the land, I mean, the Belvedere Land Company, uh, the land, Landmark Society, um, we um, sell scans, you know, that you can then print. You know, and we have tens of thousands, as you might imagine, um, of all different topics. And so you can, come into the Landmark Society archives, which is in the Boardwalk Shopping Center across from Rustic Bakery, easy to find. Mm -hmm. um, we're there from nine to one most of the week. Call up, all the information's on our website, landmarksociety.com. This is from Helene. Is the initial cod fishery in Belvedere now the unused block er blocked area on the Belvedere Street? No, it's, it's the end of West Shore. It's about the last maybe 20 houses in West Shore is where the cod fishery was. If you if you go out to the take West Shore, it ends. And there's a great big rock, which you can see in some of those photos. It's a, that's where the cod fishery ended too, because you couldn't really build past that rock. And uh, and it, it just, it was pretty big outfit. I mean, probably about maybe 20 to 30 of those houses. That's how long it was. Hmm. But again, it was built out over the water. It was built on tide lots. Hmm. Okay, how about this question is, what was the name of the ferry that was parked on the shore near downtown Sausalito in the 60s? I recall a ferry that had all sorts of little trinket shops in it. Oh, I know what this one is. Uh, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't remember. I know there, I know of uh, that when I've seen pictures of it. I'm not an expert on Sausalito history, of course. Yes. Um, I don't remember the name of it. It's got a, I know what I recognize. The Van Dam. Van Dam, that's it. 
Yeah, yeah. I can't believe we remembered that. Yep, it's yep, unmistakable. Yep. And yep. next month we will have a Sausalito historian. So come back and we can ask him more about the Van Dam. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, Great story. There's a lot to it. Yes. Uh, okay. So here is that very historian. In fact, this is Mike Moyle, next month's historian. And he asks, were Corinthian Island and Belvedere part of John Reed's rancho? Yes, they were. I mean, the, the Corinthian Island wasn't much. And, and as far as we can tell, John Reed, um, I mean, he had all of the Corte de Merdere de Presidio, um, which included Belvedere and Corinthian Island. But when... Um, all these ranchos, they had to be confirmed with the U.S. government once they became part of the United States and no longer part of Mexico. And the islands were actually supposed to be federal property when a, when a state came, came into being. Any water-bound island was, state, was federal property. That's why Alcatraz is a federal prison, was a federal prison. That's why Angel Island was always a federal property until the state bought it and turned it into a park. All the all the things, the immigration station, the bases during the war forts during the World War One and Civil War, all federal. So there was a little. Dis Corinthian was too small to be bothered, with. so that was never thought about. But Belvedere, there was a little controversy. At first, the government thought that was an island, therefore it was theirs. But the owners convinced the government that the little San Rafael, uh, I mean San Rafael Ave, which was called the County Road or the Spit the little gravel spit that connected it to Tiburon, they convinced them that that made it a peninsula. Mm -hmm. So it's actually, although we call it Belvedere Island, it's actually what's called a peninsula island at one point, which is an oxymoron. But <laughs> that was considered part of Reed's property. And Corinthian was never really much of anything. So it was bought and sold like a big piece of property, like islands in the Caribbean. Hmm. This is from Nona. Hi. Nona, what's notable, she says, about the last aerial photo is the absence of vegetation, not to mention residences. What is the year of that aerial? Oh, the very, the very last one? Yeah, there, there is some. I mean, that, that one is, um, let's see if I can find it. I think it was the 60s, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, that yeah, was at the very end. Let me just find it again. Where's my, where is it? Mouse isn't working right. Whoops. Do you see what I'm doing here? No. Nope. Uh, yeah, okay. But anyway, yeah, it, it was that that last one. That last one was see, no, that was that was uh that was let's see, I we had the yacht club harbor. Yeah, it was probably the 60s. Mm -hmm. But even, you know, the trees here have grown a lot since the 60s. I mean, yeah, where I live, I'm on, on Paradise Drive. And I bought this house had little tiny, I have a photo actually, it's an aerial photo of Paradise K, which is right below me. And you can see my house. And there were trees, a line of trees on my property in the 70s that were just planted. And they are now 60 feet high. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't take long, particularly for Monterey Pines and things like that, to, to vegetate a whole, whole peninsula like they have. But you'll know that the places that have been saved and preserved, Ring Mountain, um, the old St. Hilary's open space, no trees, mm -hmm. because those are, as they were, always were, empty. And for all of you that are asking about where can we see the photos and the wonderful talk, this talk, again, is going to be made available shortly once Franklin processes it. It'll be, you can go to the Mill Valley Historical Society, go to the first Wednesday talks, and you'll see the poster for this talk, and you'll be able to watch the video and share uh i apologize it wasn't quite as tight as i wanted it yeah well considering <laughs> and, what and happened last month i think we're doing great yeah it was, yeah, but anyway, with, yeah apart from the occasional acts of god this is this is just a fantastic fantastic talk and i Here's will be doing it live in a couple different places over the next few months oh, so stay tuned uh this is from george are there pictures of the hotel on the corinthian island the, there, there was no hotel in Corinthian. The, the hotel is on Beach Road. Um, that's that's the big grand Belvedere Hotel, which was there from about 18, 
1899 until 1925 when they when they bought it and tore it down to build the San Francisco Yacht Club. So are there are more pictures of the inside. No, none. Never oh. seen any pictures of it. No, no. Mm. I think maybe it's a amazing. sketchy picture of one of the verandas on the on the front, but mostly just from the out from the shore. So much wood to build these wonderful places, and they often don't last very long. I know. I know the ships too. You know, that's what's amazing about the China Cabin on Beach Road is that's that was built in 1867 in New York. Is a is a little club a little cabin on the top of a ship, and it's still there in 18 in this yeah. 19 a great in big hotel that's in last but. Yeah, 10 or 15 it, it, years. Here's one. Uh, oh, this is a good question. I recall that before the townhomes were built on the former Tiburon rail yard, there was a con lot of controversy about the soil there, whether it was polluted or safe for homes. Is that a correct memory? Yes. Um, well, I don't know if there's much controversy about it. They they did have to dig up a lot of, uh, obviously, it was a rail yard. There was oil. There was lots of asbestos because the entire boiler of a railroad engine is wrapped in asbestos um, it, it, and they dug out a lot and that's probably pretty much what the big water lagoon is in in the point tiburon development oh. that's dug out stuff that they had to take to to a to a special you know dump where you put uh, toxic waste that, and that's what happened supposedly there's a rail engine down in there somewhere but <laughs> like the La Brea target. I've, I've talked to, yeah, yeah. I've talked to the the guy who built the place, and he thinks there's still think that no no one's ever gone down to find out. <laughs> when was the the were those townhouses built? They were finished in 1984. There was a long. I mean, 68 was the 67 was the last train left. The rail yard, for all intents and purposes, was sort of finished by maybe 1970, and they everybody the local architects were already submitting plans, and it was a big deal. The land was still owned by Southern Pacific. Southern Pacific always owned Northwestern Pacific. It was a subsidiary of Southern Pacific. And they had their own development company. And it took from the early 70s until about 1980, maybe a little longer than that, for the town and the railroad and the developers and everybody to come to agreement on what would go there because it's such a precious piece of land. And it took a long time. And there were a lot of concessions gotten out of the developers because the land kept going up and up and up and up in value during that whole time. Mm -hmm. So so they were able to get the save the depot museum de building on the shoreline. The shoreline itself became public property. All that was part of the deal. And and of course they improved infrastructure down Tiburon Boulevard and all that kind of stuff. But it was I have I made a video about it. There's a video <laughs> on, on it's called it's called uh, railroad condos. And uh, and you can it, and it goes into great deal of depth of the different designs. There were some wild designs, you know, you know, marina type things and all kinds of different things were thrown out there, but the people wanted it to kind of stay open for people to share the shoreline with everyone. So that's where it ended up at. Well, thank you for that. Okay, we've got little time, but more questions, so we'll try to move through these. Sure. Uh, can you talk about the boat building that was done in Tiburon? Also, I heard that they did boat dismantling on the eastern side of the peninsula. Is yes. this true? Correct. Well, the, the, the only you know major ship was the Ukiah. That was the only one actually, the ferry that was built. It was built more or less right where Tiburon Boulevard and Main Street come together. It was launched right there. Um, that's the only one. There was, a, I think, maybe a smaller one. Um, there was some boat building of you know smaller boats sailboats and stuff because there were a lot of sailors around there and there are three yacht clubs um and but i don't know a lot about it but the shipwrecking was big before the railroad even got there there are pictures of the harbor at tiburon with bunches of ships that are being prepared to be wrecked and what they would do and this is what happened to the china too the great big china was 300 feet long um trans-pacific ocean liner and it was wood, so it became obsolete. They needed iron hull and screws, and it was a side wheeler. And so they got rid of it quickly. And so that, um, it, along with others, were torn. What they did is they would take off things, like they took the cabin off, they take the engine out, they take things that they could scrap while it sat in the water. Then they would push it up on shore. And if you'd been to Tiburon at low tide, it just basically is beach down there. They'd shove it up on shore, set it afire. And then when it all burned out, they'd go and collect the copper and brass and all that stuff. Um, so that was done quite a bit. And then eventually, because the ferries were coming and going, they say, hey, you can't scrap ships in the middle of our harbor anymore. So they moved around to where Paradise K is. And that was that's actually where 
China was eventually finally wrecked. Um, but it was a big business. So the, some of the guys who ran those businesses were were very wealthy. They had big houses in Belvedere and they wrecked ships because it was a real common thing. They didn't last very long. So they had to do something with them. Hmm. We've got a clarification from Phil. The Charles Van oh, Dam was Juanita's restaurant in Sausalito. I believe the Berkeley was downtown Sausalito Berkeley, with that, Tr yeah, Trace Fair that. on it. Yeah. Thank you, Phil. Uh, Okay, Does here's from Anne. Does the Landmark Society have uh, paintings of early shores? Not a lot. We have a lot of paintings. There were a lot, as, as you know, even today, there were, art was a big thing in, Tib in Tiburon and Belvedere for a long time. A lot of plein air painters going back to the uh, 19th century. But we don't have, we have some of the hills and stuff. I don't think we have too many. I have, we have one painting actually of the, of the West Shore cod fishery, um, and all the industrial areas weren't topics for painting. They they painted the pretty stuff. They, we have very few paintings of the railroad yard or anything like that because it wasn't a topic that people wanted to paint. Mm. Uh, let's see. Uh, we've got Phil Mike Moyle coming in hey, from Mike. Sausalito again. <laughs> Phil is correct. Although the collection of shops on the ferry boat Berkeley was called the trade fair, the ship is now down in San Diego. Thanks, Mike. Oh, it's still going. Uh, here's one from Stephanie. Uh, the Eureka Ferry is on display at the High Street Pier. Yeah, is the correct. pier open on the first Saturday, Shanty Singh? Good. Lately, it's been closed a lot. During COVID, it was all closed. It's yeah, worth seeing to go see that ship, the Eureka which was built in Tiburon, basically. Um, it's just, and you see, and they have, you can see the engine, this gigantic thing, one cylinder engine that ran that thing go about 15 or 20 knots. And, and it was huge with, and, and you go and they have the auto deck with some old cars on it and you can go upstairs and they've been done a nice restoration of it. It's really a great thing to see. Uh, there was some damage. We actually, for those of you interested in the Eureka Ferry, you can go to our past talks and we've got one of the rangers from the pier and he does a wonderful job with his talk, but there was some damage in some, uh, I forget what the deal was. I think there was some swells and so they had to do some work. It should be open soon though. Uh, here's another anonymous. Please return for another presentation about Marin. You're a wealth of knowledge and history. Thank you. Thank you. I concur. Um, I'm going to do two more questions and then we've got to close. Here's from Michelle. Why was St. Hillary's built so far away from the town? <laughs> well, we don't really know the full story. It's not that far, really. Um, but it's, uh, you know, a lot of churches were built on hills, of course. The story is that this was land owned by uh, Hillarita and Benjamin Lyford. Um, Hillarita Reed being the daughter of John Reed, the first grantee. And and Lyford, the story is that Lyford, the, the, the priest came and he was a little bit overweight and Lyford was a health nut and he made him walk up the hill <laughs> to put the, the building up there. And it was just a mission church. It was one. Of, it was like a, a, you know, where the, the priest would only come on horseback. He didn't live there or anything and he would come out. It was a, it was a sub church of the, of the diocese of, of uh, San Francisco. So yeah, it, it, but that's not uncommon for churches to be up on the hill. And it is exactly where it was built in 1888. Last question. More about the developments on the on the Tiburon, please. I don't think we have enough time to talk about more of the developments. Maybe that should be another talk. Do 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 visit do visit um our website because I have a history of the Tiburon Boulevard. I have a history of the condos to I mean the railroad to condos. Uh, there's the Tiburon Railroad uh, video that I showed that you didn't hear. Um, I have a long film about uh, Richardson Bay when it was threatened with being filled in in 1950s and when the Byford House was moved from Strawberry over to where it is now at the Audubon Center. Um, I have a, a pretty good video about uh, coming about Fountain, the fountain that's downtown. Oh. I filmed them, I filmed them yeah. through the whole process of building it. And they're, the, two, the two artists, husband and wife, uh, they're wonderful people, and, and they were really fun to work with as they went through and built the whole thing. They, basically, the two of them built the whole thing from, from demo to, to finishing it. It's incredible. So that, that's a pretty neat video. Nobody, nobody watches that one very much. It's called About Coming About.
<laughs> we don't have enough time for this talk. I can see that. Yeah, that's, a, that's why I make the movies and people can watch yeah. them. Right. Well, I've got to close this up, but I want to say thanks so much. You were worth the wait. Thank and you. all the little glitches that went on. This was such a lovely talk. Thank you so much. Thank it's you. been lovely working with you. And I think we should plan on, uh, well, one thing is, well, you and I are going to talk about an oral history. Okay. Uh, I'd love to take a, an oral, your oral history and get some of this more detailed information down in our our uh, oral history collection. Mill, Mill Valley and Tiburon are, are very connected. The yes. older historians, the older historians, uh, you know, Lucretia Little and Louise Tether were, you know, joined at the hip. They're great historians, both of them. Yeah. Uh, Louise was our first historian and she collected a lot of stuff and, and, uh, and, and a lot of it came over from Mill Valley because they shared the common read history. Yes. Yes, there is a lot of commonality. In fact, I'm living in a house that was built by an old Tiburon family, the Moitozas. And very many of the railroad workers lived in Mill Valley. Yes. During yeah. the whole era of the railroad operation Tiburon, they lived in Mill Valley too. Yeah. Well, thanks again. Wonderful presentation. Just Pleasure. Fascinating. I love sharing um, the stuff we have. <laughs> For those of you who have enjoyed our weekly email history vignettes composed by local historian Chuck Oldenburg, you will be pleased to hear that those vignettes have been bound into a new book called Mill Valley History Vignettes, Volume 2. It's a compilation of 152 of Chuck's most recent vignettes. Volume 2 makes a wonderful companion to Chuck's original book, Mill Valley History Vignettes, which continues to be available on our Mill Valley Historical Society bookstore. And also available in our bookstore is Ventures of Two Coast Miwok Children, written by my dear friend and fellow former board member, um, Betty Girk. And this beautiful book brings alive Marin County's Coast Miwok legacy as it explores the daily, daily lives of a real boy and girl who lived in neighboring villages on San Francisco Bay in the late 1700s. The little boy in this story is named Week Musa, and he would grow up to be known as Chief Marin, Marin County's namesake. It's a precious and truly beautiful book and a great gift for children and adults. Also, the Mill Valley Historical Society has honored both Betty Girk and Chuck Olenberg with a Lifetime Achievement Award, and that's an Living Award, which has just been planted at the Mill Valley Public Library with a beautiful plaque in their honor. I invite you to go visit this beautiful tree and maple tree and plaque. It's right behind the Smart Garden in the front of the library, and we're very, very happy to honor them in this way. Well, that just about wraps it up. Thanks again to Dave for his wonderful presentation and to Franklin for your invaluable technical support and to all of you in the audience for your interest and patronage. Please join us next month. That's February 4th, 2023 for Southern Marin's Portuguese Roots with Sausalito historian, Mike Moyle, who's already made his presence with us tonight. Till then, be well and good night.